to our next talk in this session, which will be by Daniel. Uh, oh, I am going to mangle your last name, so I would prefer that you say it yourself. I mangle my own last name every day. I think it's Furigal, but let, let's okay. go with that. Great. So uh, thank you. So Daniel is going to be telling us about uh, visual mismatch responses are a product of surprise, but not fulfilled expectations. And so this looks great. So whenever you are ready, please take it away. Thanks. All right. Um, yeah. Hi, everybody. My name is Daniel Furfuru, um, and I'll be talking about uh, oddball sequences, visual mismatch responses, and surprise. So imagine you're walking down the street and you see oh, a dog. <laughs> Sorry, computer malfunction there. Um, but of course, um, you wouldn't see a dog in isolation. You would typically see a dog in the context of some environment. Um, perhaps you're out in a green field. And based on this, you might expect to see um, perhaps another dog or another dog. You might be in a dog park, which would be a happy place to be. And so based on this sort of information, you wouldn't expect to see something like a toaster um, appear. And so here's a fairly silly example of um, how uh, the context and our prior expectations and knowledge come to bear on um, influencing our expectations about what we will see in the immediate future, which can help us more appropriately interact or perceive these types of objects. So people have investigated this in the lab using oddball sequences in which um, individual images are presented one at a time. So here we have rooster, 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 toaster. And so based on this sequence, you might come to expect the rooster to appear um, because of its higher prevalence uh, rather than sort of rarer toaster image. And conversely, you might have a sim um, the opposite. So toaster, 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 wait for it, rooster. And here we can compare evoked brain responses um, by the same images in each of these two contexts, um, labeled the standard and the deviant. And so um, there's been hundreds of ERP studies uh, comparing these images and they typically find more negative going um, evoked potentials over bilateral posterior sites um, for deviants compared to standards. And that's about the extent of where we agree in the field and it's controversy from here on in. So there's been a very long standing debate about what visual mismatch responses reflect and actually what experimental manipulations are necessary to produce them. So for example, it could be prediction error signaling as specified in different predictive coding counts, um, novelty detection or um, yeah, detection of these unusual events or something like repetition suppression or adaptation um, by feed forward or intrinsic mechanisms, which could even sort of account or facilitate these other two things here. And I think the reason why this has been controversial is because different effects are intermixed um, within these sorts of designs. So the standard and the deviant are also common and rare expected and surprising, and also repeated and immediately unrepeated images. And so to sort of boil this down into a series of small hypotheses or easily testable ones, um, we can think about what is driving this mismatch response or this ERP difference wave between the deviant and the standard stimuli. So for example, we might have a response enhancement for deviant stimuli without much of an effect of on the expected stimuli here. We could have a response suppression for the standards, which are repeated and expected without such effects on the deviants. Um, and so we could think of this as repetition effects or expectation suppression, or we could have a mixture of both suppression and enhancement um, for the standards and the deviants respectively. And so we've gotten part way to answering this question um, by including equal probable control sequences, whereby a large number of different images are presented uh, within a sequence. So participants can't form expectations for um, any particular image and none of them are immediately repeated. So by comparing the equal probable control and the deviant um, uh, conditions, we can get effects of surprise fairly easily. However, effects of expectations seem to be still conflated with effects of stimulus repetition um, in these designs. And so what we wanted to do is to try to isolate and quantify effects of fulfilled expectations and surprise relative to some sort of expectation neutral condition in a cleaner way. And also to um, figure out whether we could find graded effects of expectation or surprise by stimulus appearance probability. And this speaks to some theories that would hypothesize that you know, the objective appearance probability um, determines how big uh, these effects are. So using existing designs, this would have been very difficult because of the sheer numbers of trials and stimuli that you need to present. And when, it, when manipulating appearance probability, this gets even worse. 
So I took the advice of my grandmother who said, if you walk faster, you get there faster. Accordingly, we used fast periodic visual stimulation or FPVS developed in Bruno's lab. And here's an example from um, Joanne Liu Shuang's um, seminal paper where a base face image um, similar to Tile's design um, is presented at a very rapid rate here at six times a second. And then every seventh face image is replaced by a face of a different identity to these base faces known as the oddball. And here I'll specify that we're actually in the experiments I'll in the experiment I'll present, um, you can have expected or surprising oddballs dependent on this context. And participants task was to um, detect a fixation cross color change uh, from blue to red. So in these sequences, uh, briefly, people usually see a fixation cross, then the contrast uh, ramps up over two seconds. We have a full contrast stimulation period, uh, whereas the oddball and the base stimuli each appear at their respective periodicities, then a ramp down and a fixation cross period. And uh, in these uh, designs, you can manipulate the relative probabilities of each oddball that might appear in the sequence. So here's an example from a, an older study where um, we had the base face and then the oddball could either be the same face identity as this base face or a different face identity. Um, and the relative probability of these can be manipulated. And because these oddballs are periodic, um, this means that participants can come to expect specific oddball face identities at specific times. And one of the nice things about this is that um, basically by presenting a whole bunch of base faces between these, you can um, control for immediate stimulus repetition effects by continuously adapting the system to that base face. So uh, in the experiment we ran, um, we had a base face and two different oddball uh, identities from the base face. Uh, and it, we manipulated the probability with which each face could appear. So we had a common and rare, so a 90-10 split, 80-20 splits, 70-30, 60-40, and an equal 50-50 split condition. And these were presented, of course, in different uh, stimulation sequences. And one important thing is that we use different base and oddball faces for each sequence type so that we didn't get carryover of expectations that were linked to these specific images. Okay, so there are a number of different outcomes we could expect. Um, so we have the different probability conditions at the bottom and then some sort of normalized uh, amplitude on the y-axis. First, there was the null model, which we hoped wouldn't happen because that would be quite boring. Then we had the expectation only model where expected stimuli had a dampened response um, compared to the 50% neutral and the surprising conditions. Uh, a graded version of this uh, where the stimulus probability sort of had a gradual proportional effect on this. A surprise only condition where the neutral and expectation, expected conditions were quite similar and there was only an effect of surprise. A graded version of this and then of course a combination of expectation and surprise effects. So what did we find? Uh, based looking at the grand average ERPs, um, we can see this sort of gradual, uh, more negative going ERP waveform for the surprising uh, compared to the neutral and the expected conditions. Um, and we'll see this a bit clearly in a second. And here we can identify two time windows over which this, um, there are surprising expected differences. So between 200 and 350 milliseconds and between 500 and 1000 milliseconds. And by looking at the surprising expected differences, um, you can see these uh, sort of difference waveforms quite clearly. And this is how we derived our region of interest, regions of interest. Um, so we compared surprising and expected, but then for subsequent analyses, we compared either surprising or expected to the neutral condition and never against each other. So we did this to avoid circularity in our analyses. And here you can see that the surprising um, has a more negative going uh, ERP is the neutral, uh, but we don't see much of an effect of, of expectation here. Uh, this is also mirrored by the scalp maps. So you can see that the neutral and expected are similar and the surprising ones are quite different. And for reference, here are these sort of individual condition maps, which also shows this quite clearly. Okay, so we then got a region of interest averaged uh, mean amplitudes. So uh, to orient you again, um, here we have the individual probability conditions at the bottom, and then the amplitude difference to the neutral condition as the y-axis. So these are all compared to the 50-50 condition here. And what we found was that surprising stimuli evoked more negative going um, ERPs across these conditions compared to the neutral condition. Whereas we didn't really find this for expected um, stimuli. So if anything, the 60% was slightly more negative and for the others, the base factors indicated um, evidence uh, preferring the null. 
And this was also found for the later time window um, and almost sort of this came out a bit more clearly even here. So out of these three competing hypotheses, I think that we have a clear winner, um, that there is sort of effects, there are effects of surprise um, in particular, but not really effects of expectation suppression. And this might be surprising to you based on the literature. Um, so we actually ran um, a review, did a review looking at um, expectation in the visual system, and we found that there's actually very scant or inconsistent evidence for this compared to neutral conditions, um, and especially almost absent effects in um, electrophysiological um, recordings as well. So how do we understand uh, visual mismatch responses? To finish up, uh, visual mismatch responses seem to index a surprise response, which seem to be um, shown all or none uh, response. So no clear graded effects of stimulus probability. Um, we didn't, I didn't cover that, but this is, is what we found in our study. They seem to be gated by attention or the task relevance of the stimulus, at least in some studies here, as cited here. And they're also larger following changes in one's visual environment um, compared to sort of unexpected repetitions of the same stimulus. And so we think that this might um, reflect something, a precursor to the orienting response or something that might be necessary for things like post-surprise or post-error um, decision, adjust, decision making adjustments and things linked to reward learning and these sorts of things. Uh, we have a preprint um, as was nicely posted and our article was recently accepted for publication. To finish up, I'd very much like to thank my collaborators, especially Jane, who um, really sharpened up the experiment design and collected all of this data, but also Jen, Hinza and Stefan, whose expertise really benefited this project at every step. Um, again, here are all of our Twitter fam handles and thank you for listening. Fantastic, thank you, Daniel. And if you enjoyed the talk, please drop some praise in the chat because we don't have any applause here. So we have um, a couple questions here and maybe we can do them relatively in quick succession. It looks like maybe the first one got answered already, but Mohammed, I'm actually going to give you a microphone and let you know uh, or at, let you answer. Did, did your question get answered? Are, aren't repetition suppression and prediction error almost the same arguments? Uh, well, I think I probably missed it if it was answered. Okay, great. Then, <laughs> then uh, we can do this question. <laughs> oh, fantastic. This is one of my favorite okay. ones. Um, so, yeah, this, uh, there is the argument um, that repetition, suppression, and prediction error signaling are the same thing. Um, I think this is something that's pushed a lot in certain veins of the predictive coding literature. But one of the things is it actually relies on certain assumptions um, about you know, when we observe expectation suppression and how this corresponds to repetition effects. Um, a lot of papers that have purported to find expectation suppression actually have this stimulus repetition confound. So you have to almost assume that they are the same to find evidence that they are the same sort of um, uh, the same thing. That said, there are more nuanced arguments. Um, there are competing models of the predictive coding that account, um, especially sort of Marta Garrido's work, which has this, um, sort of very repetition driven error signaling uh, approach, which seems to um, hold water. There are also sort of circuit based um, local and, and feed forward accounts of these um, models, which actually predict quite a lot of the same thing as predictive coding. So there's a lot of model mimicry, but they can account for some other things, sort of inherited adaptation and other effects like that. So this is really an open question, but um, if you think, if you're wondering, do effects of, of repeating an image, are they the same as um, these probabilistic queuing sort of designs or effects of entraining people's expectations to see a particular image? I'd say that the evidence says, uh, no, these are different effects. Okay. Uh, hopefully Thank that helped. Great. I guess I can clap since I'm unmuted. So. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Fantastic. And um, Mohammed, I'm, I'm going to uh, ask um, maybe Daniel to answer your other question in chat. Um, because I think that it's a more pointed question. Um, and then the, the last question that we have time for here is from Byron Price, who asks, um, what are the average time differences between oddball stimuli in the different conditions? Uh, for example, from one 10% oddball stimulus to the next versus the 90% oddball to the next. Uh, so this is a fantastic question. Um, and it speaks to one shortcoming of our design so um, the oddball intervals, if you like, were 1.16 seconds. Um, so we had this just to have a reasonable number of base stimuli um, uh, 
uh, but also to sort of uh, try to keep these surprise related ERPs away from the next stimulus as well. Um, the so I guess for the 90%, typically it was about 1.16 seconds. Um, and for the 10%, it could have been 10 seconds or, or more. Um, so here there is a sort of delayed repetition or um, a sort of a recency confound, which we haven't fully accounted for here in our design. Um, we did control for immediate repetition, but um, these sort of longer uh, lag design uh, effects are insidious and, and occur quite a lot in other designs which try to control for this as well. I think that um, I'd, I'm happy to talk about this more in the tech in the chat. But one thing I think this doesn't completely explain our findings is that um, we found the step sort of function difference between the surprising and the uh, neutral conditions, which according to these sorts of delayed repetition models, I don't think they could really uh, capture that in or, or it's a little bit problematic for them to uh, to capture this pattern in our data specifically. Okay, great. So um, I, I encourage you guys to continue uh, the discussion in the Q&A box and in the chat. And um, with that, uh, we'll thank Dave.